Um, welcome to uh, the start of Fair Trade Fortnight, um, and thank you for bearing with us while we while we get our fantastic live link up working. My name is Mike Gidney. I'm the chief executive of the Fair Trade Foundation in the UK, um, and welcome to our second virtual Choose the World You Want festival. Well, I don't know about you, but this isn't exactly the world that I would choose. We still can't meet up in person um, across the world as we'd like because of the pandemic. Um, and a storm, Franklin, blasts the UK, our third storm this month. It's pretty clear to all of us how vulnerable we all are to a hostile climate. Um, and we can see from the slow progress made at the COP26 climate talks in Glasgow last year, that climate justice, real meaningful climate justice is still a long way off. But happily, fair trade is all about being practical, being optimistic. And today we offer you a warm welcome against the storms and a chance to get close to two of the farmers who are tackling these problems for us every day. Farmers, as we've often said in fair trade, are experts in managing the land. Um, and it continues to be extraordinary to me that they are just too often overlooked um, and their expertise taken for granted. Fair trade is all about changing that. And that's what we're going to start by doing this morning. We're going to be joined um, live by the miracle of satellite technology from Ghana and Peru shortly. Um, but first off, let me just give you a couple of housekeeping points. During the webinar, you'll be able to see Bismarck uh, from Ghana and Hugo from Peru, uh, Kieran, the translator, and me. You won't see anybody else. There are too many of us all to get on the screen, but don't worry, we can't see or hear you either. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. We've had loads. We're going to try and group them together and get through as many as we can. But it's also not too late. If there's something burning that you, you, you hear during the, during the conversation, just put a question in the chat in the comment section on the YouTube uh, link, and we'll see what we can do to get your questions answered. Please also note that this session is going to be recorded, um, and it'll be available to watch again on the festival website. Okay, so let's crack on. Um, I'm delighted, really thrilled to introduce our two special guests. First is Bismarck Kapabiti, who is a cocoa farmer from the Kwapa Cocoa Farmers Union in Ghana. He's therefore part shareholder in Divine Chocolate, who purchased Kwapa's cocoa, of course, very famously. Bismarck is a lead trainer for dynamic agroforestry under the Alliances for Sankofa project. Having adopted dynamic agroforestry himself, he's now encouraging the older generation to register land so that the next generation can also become engaged in dynamic agroforestry. So that's a fantastic intergenerational approach. I've actually visited Sanko for a few years ago, and I saw the amazing results of farming with nature in this way. And so I'm really keen to hear how it's going. Um, many of us will also have seen Bismarck in action as one of Fairtrade's lead advocates at the uh, climate talks in Glasgow before Christmas. He was incredibly articulate, so it'll be wonderful to get his insights into how the COP26 talks were from a farmer's perspective. And we also have Hugo Guerrero, who is a third generation coffee farmer from the region of Peru in Peru, northern Peru. He's currently researching new farming methods and developing organic products to diversify his farming. Diversification, as we know, is a, is, a, is a key method through which farmers take control of their lives and build better businesses. Hugo has particular expertise in soil grafting as a technique to build climate resilience. And that'll be you know, great to hear about that as well. And, and Hugo, we're looking forward to you explaining more about what soil grafting entails. Just so you all know as well, Hugo is here with Kieran, his, trans his translator, um, and thank you, Kieran, for joining us. It's a, it's a hell of a responsibility, but really appreciate it. So I'm going to start off straight away with a question for each of you, um, and really just asking you to describe a little about what life is like um, as a farmer today in your country. Bismarck, perhaps you go first, and then we'll turn to Hugo. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm most grateful to be also part of Fairtrade Fortnite this year. It's another opportunity for me uh, as far as COP26 is concerned. Uh, as an advocate, I'll start by saying that, like you mentioned, my name is Bismarck Babite, a young cocoa producer from Ghana, a member of the Kuyapa Cocoa Farmers Union, which is a cooperative certified by Fairtrade. And for that matter, uh, I have a role and responsibilities to play. Currently, the main topic we've all been discussing is about climate issues. 
relating to past 10 years, looking at how my parents have been farming because I was born in a family of cocoa uh, production. And through that, uh, I've been able to be educated or go to school and then acquire some basic knowledge and also can speak a bit of English. And with what is happening now, uh, my parents, to start, my parents are growing older. They cannot participate actively in agriculture or cocoa production. So we, the next generation, have to take over. And it is one of my priority to also continue cocoa production or uh, be a farmer. And looking at what I've inherited from my parents or I'm about to inherit uh, from my parents, climate change has really brought a negative impact on uh, the natural resources like the land we are having now, the produce, uh, irrespective of our cash crop, cocoa, annual crops, and all other uh, plants. Personally, uh, I have a wife and a kid who is two years old. I live in a small community uh, with a member uh, population of about 1,000, between 1,000 and 2,000. And most of these people are all cocoa producers. And therefore, living in such a community, there's no way I can do away with cocoa production. Therefore, I need to stick. But developing the interest of continuing the uh, cocoa production or being uh, the future for the coming uh, generation, then we need to put up some new measures. You need to have motivational instruments that can lead me as a young farmer to continue production. But it's unfortunate uh, climate has become one of the major problems uh, some of us are facing. As a young producer, currently I can tell you that uh, if I compare production between this now and then 10 years back, I've realized production has reduced drastically for about 70, 80%. And it is really affecting our financial status. Yeah. Uh, if at this time that my parents are going old, they have to get something from their produce, their sweat, and they are rather uh, getting the negative aspect, then it becomes a heartbreaking factor. So as a young one to continue uh, cocoa production, I realized I need to use my knowledge I've acquired in going to school, the, the money they had from their cocoa production 10 years, 15 years back to take me to school and then also bring out new techniques. So it, uh, it got to a time, Fair Trade as a body uh, introduced this Sankofa, not only Fair Trade, we have uh, these uh, partners, a lot of them for the uh, Alliance of uh, uh, Action, the Sankofa project, we have a lot of them, but and they introduced this new project, the Sankofa project to us. And as a young graduate who uh, is more interested in uh, producing cocoa, I decided to go and then know what is at stake because uh, relating to the system of farming now, it is not favorable to us because uh, one, whenever you plant new cocoa, the new plants, they die because of the intensity of uh, the sun, we cannot predict rainfall. So even the matured cuckoo who uh, which produces pores because there's no rain for the flowers to uh, stay to produce, we lose almost everything. Also, because of the long drought, it has really introduced pests into our uh, system, the cuckoo farm, because these pests insects try to look for water around. And unfortunate thing is, the streams, the rivers around our communities are all dried out because most of the trees have been cut down and they are exposed to direct sunlight. So most of these streams, which support other animals, insect predators and other things to feed on, we've lost all those uh, rivers. And for that matter, they try to feed on this cocoa. And what happens at the end, they destroy our product, our product. and uh, also has allowed disease infestation into the system. So you are not even sure of whatever you take because the kind of produce you harvest from the food, you are, you are afraid it has been uh, attacked by diseases, insects and other things. So your health is also at a risk. And for that matter, when they introduced the Sankofa project, they gave us the understanding that it is time we need to 
put up new measures to adapt to the climate issue so that at the end we can mitigate against climate change. And this new system of farming, that is what we call the dynamic agroforestry. It aims at uh, giving us a sustainable livelihood, a, a sustainable land or farm, because currently what happened is if you are able to establish a new farm within five, 10 years, the uh, crops dies and you need to do rehabilitation, which is not helping. As a businessman, I don't think you can be doing re reinvesting in the same product every year. So uh, it was a very big blow for uh, we, the young ones, and it has even driven most of the young ones into the big cities to find mineral jobs because they find agriculture in these local areas not lucrative or not uh, uh, better anymore. But some of us. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you there, because with typical typical energy, you're leaping straight into the future, um, which is really good. I really want to get to this with you to hear more about dynamic agroforestry. But you've described really well the, 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 the challenges yeah. of farming today. So the problems we all of us need to overcome if we want to be able to enjoy your cocoa in the future. Um, let me also just bring um, Hugo in as well and ask Hugo, the same question. Just tell me a little bit about what life is like on your farm today. To, to uh, European eyes, it looks beautiful seeing the, the landscape behind you. But I would love to hear more um, about how life is like today for you as a farmer. Hugo, entonces la misma pregunta para ti. Eh, podemos ver las, las, las vistas fantásticas para nosotros europeos aquí que vemos. Pero ¿cómo es la vida como caficultor actualmente ahí en Perú? No, hoy... Hoy en día es un hoy en día es un poco complicado más que todo para los para los jóvenes como nosotros ya de las de la tercera generación de, de productores de café. ¿Por qué? Porque tenemos muchos retos, ¿no? Cambio climático como las bajas eh, producciones en el cultivo de café. Entonces, a esto, eh, mi persona, yo termino la universidad en el año 2011. Yo estudié en Lima. Y, 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 y decidí regresar. Entonces, a mi comunidad, ¿no? Diferente, ¿no? De la que se venían haciendo, ¿no? Buscar nuevas eh, formas de cultivar, ¿no? Porque normalmente... Eh, practicaban agricultura orgánica, pero sin ningún tipo de tecnología, ¿no? Entonces, eh, en mi entorno, ¿no? Por ejemplo, dos de café como también de la caña de azúcar. Con eso yo hago biofertilizantes, una serie de algunos orgánicos para regresarlos al mismo cultivo, ¿no? Entonces eso me ha permitido a mí mantener ¿no? unas, unas dos como orgánico, no tengo las producciones que, que tiene un productor convencional, ¿no? Porque usa insecticidas, usan pesticidas, usan una serie de abonos eh, químicos que a esto les ayuda a mantener producciones altas, pero eh, el producto final no va a ser un, un producto saludable. ¿no? Entonces, eh, para mí lo más importante como productor de café es obtener un producto sano, ¿no? para todos los consumidores del comercio. Pues, creo que es, o sea, es, esa es la meta de un, como yo, eh, bueno, diría que la vida de un, de un productor en Perú es una vida, eh, me siento satisfecho de ser un productor de café. Eh, se necesita esfuerzo, dedicación, ¿no? Eh, pero sin eso yo creo que no podríamos 
seguir adelante, ¿no? Y, y, y para mí creo que es, eh, también producimos este, panela granulada, que es un azúcar ecológica, eh, para todos los, los consumidores de comercio justo, ¿no? De, de, de Reino Unido, ¿no? Y más que todo, productos eh, saludables, ¿no? Que ese es lo, digamos, lo más importante, ¿no? Podemos tener altas productos, creo que no sería el fin de, de, de un productor, ¿no? Yeah, so, um, so, so far, obviously the connection was a bit bad, but we'll go through what we can get. Um, so today it's, it's quite difficult to be... Um, to produce coffee and to be a coffee producer um, in Peru. You know, I'm, I'm third generation from, you know, my my family, my going back in time, my family produced coffee. And, and I went to university and kind of did things a little bit differently. I went to university in in, in the capital, in Lima, um, and I learned about different techniques. I finished my studies in 2011, and then I came back to my local area where I was born, where I was from, and I wanted to produce coffee, but in a different way. Um, it's true that... Coffee production has dropped in the last few years, but my idea was not to necessarily just go on and increase production, but I wanted to do it in, a, in an organic way and to kind of employ different technology. So I create biofertilizers, um, and my idea is to is about the quality that I produce and making sure that chemicals aren't added to it because there are people that are producing more coffee, but that's not the goal for me. The goal is to produce a healthy product so that the consumers are satisfied and I can also be satisfied with what I'm producing. So we also, beyond producing coffee, things like panela, uh, or organic sugar, you know, it's very, very, very popular exporting to countries like the UK. But my, my aim is almost, almost always to produce a healthy product that is not kind of quickly uh, made, that's that's done with health of the consumer in mind. Well done, Karen. That was that was that was really really good to hear. And um, yeah, thank you everybody for bearing with us with the with the uh, internet challenges. I mean, this is this is what we have to do if we want to hear from the farmers. You know, we have to recognise the the immense challenges um, that we maybe take for granted. We take our internet ac access for granted. M uh, most of our farming colleagues don't have that privilege. Um, but it is so good that you're joining us, Hugo. And um, yeah, it was, it was really good to hear that. Um, both of you, Bismarck and Hugo, have talked about um, quality and wanting to be innovative in your farming techniques and again let me come to each of you in turn and just describe a little bit about what the future holds in terms of innovation so Bismarck maybe you can tell us a bit more what you were starting to get into around what dynamic agroforestry means um, and then uh, Hugo I'll come to you in a minute and ask you to describe soil grafting and the techniques that you're that you want to deploy to just to improve the quality of the soil and the quality of your farming so Bismarck over to you first Okay, thank you very much. Like uh, I earlier mentioned, dynamic agroforestry, when it was introduced to us, we were usually uh, based in, in, the, in the conventional system of farming. Like we were used to the conventional system of farming. In this system, you clear your land, you add, you apply fire, that is you burn almost everything. On, and that's on the called, land. Bismarck, sorry to interrupt, that's called slash and burn, isn't it? Slash yes, and burn. Slash it's an old, burn. old technique. But which destroys yeah. everything after the harvest. Yes. So like you do the slash and burn, and then before you, you plant whatever, the annual crops and then the cocoa or if the other plants. But when this dynamic agroforestry was introduced to us, they made us understand that, no, we can still go by the dynamic way, adding different uh, plants on the same piece of land. Initially, if you have a plot of land to plant your cocoa, you need to also hire another one from your, uh, for your annual crops only. And it is really expensive because uh, currently we don't have much land to, to produce. So if you don't have money, you cannot acquire other lands elsewhere to produce more to protect food security. But this system has made it understand that uh, on the same piece of land, you can have your annual crops, your cocoa, your food trees, your timber trees, and any other. And during the piloting, we were like doubting because it wasn't something uh, new to, it was something new to us. So we wanted to find out the end solution. And after the piloting, after two years, we realized, okay, it is really working. And for that matter, we need to adopt this new system of farming. So on the same piece of plan, we do the slashing. 
but this time we don't burn. We don't add any organic, uh, any inorganic products to the food. So we go purely organic. And also we do our lime pegging and then we start uh, sowing our seed, planting our food crops. And then also the main thing is the cocoa. And at the end of the year, like I was saying, this project aims at giving us a sustainable livelihood, a sustainable cocoa farm, income diversification, carbon inserting, and, and uh, to mention about food. Because uh, relatively, if you don't have additional farm compared to the uh, tra uh, traditional system, if you don't have additional farming, your main purpose is to plant cocoa. Then it means at the end of the season, you need to take money from the cocoa you have to go and buy food crops from the market. But on the, uh, in this project, you have your yam, your maize, your cocoa yam, your vegetables, your plantain, almost everything on the safety supply. So one, we have food security. Also, our income has been diversified because we have different angles where we get our uh, money from. Though it might not be that much, but I think it is really helping on the, on the start. And also, uh, because we are looking forward to have a sustainable cocoa farm, we don't want this new system to die in 10 years so that my son, if he is interested to come and continue uh, cocoa producing, he need not to come and do rehabilitation again, but rather continue with what I have started because we came to inherit unproductive cocoa cocoa, which is infested by disease and other problems, and we cannot manage those farms. We need to cut everything down and then plant new cocoa. So we need to put up a new strategy to have a sustainable cocoa plantation. That is the, uh, the dynamic agroforestry. We also protect the soil by planting a lot of cover crops so that we assure that uh, there's always some form of moist in the soil to keep the plant growing. We also plant shade trees, and also add timber, which we believe they are the main source of uh, carbon insertion. So with all these practices, uh, during the dry season, we also have something we do to protect our cocoa. That is by irrigation. So we don't have much money to do commercial irrigation or electronic irrigation, but we use our plantain or banana we plant on our field and then use them as a traditional irrigation for our cocoa. And after practicing it, we realized the rate at which our cocoa dies, the mortality level has reduced. If you are able to do this uh, irrigation method uh, correctly or uh, the way you are being taught. So after this process, I realized oh, it is a good idea. And once I'm a young producer who is uh, permanently staying in the production, uh, level, then I need to adopt this uh, new system. And after following and then learning a lot of it, uh, I had the opportunity also to train other farmers who are interested in this dynamic agroforestry. We've just started, it's about uh, three to four years old now, but looking, comparing the dynamic agroforestry plot to the traditional uh, plot, we realized there is a, a vast difference from it, which we think there's much improvement in the dynamic agroforestry uh, farm uh, to the conventional one. So as a young one, uh, I take it as a responsibility to advocate on how to adapt to the dynamic agroforestry so that in, 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 the, in the end, we all come to a conclusion by solving this uh, issue on climate change. Yeah. That's so inspiring, Bismarck. And um, it, it, I, as I say, I, I was lucky enough to visit a few years ago, and it looked like the most extraordinary initiative when I, I visited because it was it was planting with nature rather than against it. You know, so so the intercropping, the lines of sacrificial plants, and the mixing of your annuals and your other crops, and then the shade as well as the ground cover. To me, it looked like the Garden of Eden. It was an extraordinary thing. Can it? Can you tell me um, what's what, has it enabled you to reduce your pesticide and insecticide use by farming in that kind of way? Please come again. Do, do, so, so what has happened to how much uh, insecticide and pesticide you use on the soil? Dynamic agriculture, dynamic agroforestry, does that help you to reduce the chemicals you put on to, onto the land? 
Yeah, thank you very much. With dynamic agroforestry on, on that particular field, we don't apply any form of pesticide or herbicide. Yeah, it's a zero uh, chemical. So it's purely organic, yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, let's hold it there. Let's ask uh, Hugo um, to tell us a little bit about soil grafting and uh, some of the techniques you're using to to improve the quality of your farms and to to uh, the, uh, particularly focus on the climate uh, resilience. Sí, Hugo. Primeramente tienes que ponerlo porque estás en silencioso, entonces se lo puedes eh, cambiar. Um... Sí, la pregunta era, eh, hablamos, hablamos un poco de los injertos que utilizas para mm, fomentar y para fortalecer la resistencia en cuanto a los cambios climáticos. Bueno, hemos hablado de los injertos de café, por ejemplo, que, que me explicaste antes. Sí, Hugo, ¿me escuchas? Eh, bueno, para mí, como... como productor de café, como, como hijo de productor de café también, y como profesional también dentro del área de, de, de agricultura, eh, ha sido un arduo trabajo, ¿no? Porque desde el 2011 siempre he tratado de, de buscar formas, ¿no? De cómo producir mejor, ¿no? Cómo, cómo tener productos sanos y a la vez cómo tener eh, rendimientos que me permitan a mí cubrir mis costos de producción. Entonces, eh, otros lugares en los cuales hacen prácticas, adaptarlas a mi zona y, y probar, ¿no? Y ver, quizás eh, eh, a mí me faltan un poco de recursos para poder ver ya la parte científica, ¿no? Digamos, que lo, yo lo hago empíricamente, yo lo hago eh, eh, mediante, digamos, el resultado que me dé en campo. ¿no? Yo lo pruebo y voy viendo los resultados que me dan. Por ejemplo, en el caso de los días antes que yo hago, ¿no? eh, los pruebo. Todo esto de biofertilizantes, por ejemplo, yo hago a base de residuos de café, a base de, de excremento de vaca, no de ciertas plantas que tienen ciertas eh, cantidades de nutrientes, por ejemplo. Kira, maybe you want to just kick off with the first part of that one. Step step plantas que tienen altos y los resultados se ven, se ven. Muy bien. Um, so for me as a, as a coffee producer, uh, you know, the son of a coffee producer as well, um, it's been it's been a lot of long work, a lot of hard work um, since 2011. I've been looking for ways to kind of better to improve production uh, in a in a healthy way and to improve performance uh, in my on my particular fields. Um, but it's difficult because it's very much um, a case of me taking methods that I've learned that I've studied and then trying to apply them in the in my local area. It's difficult really because I have to do it very much you know through trial and error and feeling my way and looking to see what works. I'm I kind of lacking in terms of scientific resources to to measure things exactly, but I can see the results you know myself in my fields and to see what's what, what's happened. Um, but to do this, you know, I, I try and use what we've already got, whatever you know byproducts. Uh, coffee produces whether it's kind of skin whether it's um other things that i can use around me like cow dung or other things that provide nutrients to to the plants and, and ultimately get results that i can see firsthand that's fascinating both of you are describing um you know real ingenuity and practical innovation and um, just linked to that we've had a, a number of people asking us about the importance of community, the importance particularly of your cooperatives. You know, being organized is one of the fundamental principles of being fair trade. And people are asking, what role does your cooperative play? How do they help? How does it work? And perhaps Hugo, can we start with you and then go to Bismarck after? 
Hugo, ¿nos, ¿nos puede explicar un poco lo que significa formar parte de una co cooperativa y, y, y lo que trae esto y lo que te da? Cambiarte modo silencio primero, por favor. Y ahora. ¿Escuchaste la pregunta? No, 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 no te escuché. Ah, entonces la, era la importancia de, de estar, formar parte de una cooperativa y lo que te da esto, la posibilidad de trabajar con otros productores que, que compartir ideas, esas cosas. Eh, el estar dentro de una cooperativa o el estar dentro de una, de una asociación a nosotros nos da una serie de beneficios, ¿no? Yo creo que que una persona individual no puede hacer eh, muchas cosas, pero yo creo que unidos en grupo eh, se pueden hacer muchas cosas, muchos proyectos, eh, se pueden sacar muchos proyectos adelante, no se puede, operativas se han, eh, se han logrado eh, muchas cosas, ¿no? Porque hoy en día ya eh, tenemos, primero empezamos con café, ahora ya se está con, con la caña de azúcar, no para la producción de panela que nosotros es una azúcar ecológica entonces el productor ya tiene otro ingreso más dentro de las cooperativas también se puede presentar para, para que puedan financiar ¿no? y con eh, lo que eh, nos permite también de la, de la prima de comercio justo, de la mano también con los proyectos que tenemos con el Estado, seguimos avanzando, ¿no? mejorando cada vez más nuestras infraestructuras, tanto en café como, como en panela, ¿no? So, yeah, so to be part of a, an association or a cooperative uh, gives you great benefits because one person cannot do what, you know, what many people together can do. So it allows us to move forwards with many projects. I mean, there's been lots of things that we've been able to achieve being part of this kind of larger group. Um, and it's not just um, coffee production, it's also sugar cane, panela, which is something that we produce a, a, non, a refined sugar uh, here in Peru. Um, and so that kind of diversification in what you can produce for example, producing not just coffee, but, but also sugar cane, um, means that you, you are able to, to finance other things. You have kind of a second um, secondary income, so that diversifies things. And that, along with the fair trade premium, just means you can improve things like infrastructure and just the way that you farm in general. That's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And Bismarck, how about you with Quapa? Breaking the question, so I didn't get the question. Well. If you can please repeat it for me. Yeah, no worries. And isn't isn't it wonderful to hear Hugo's farm animals in the background keeping us company through this? Um, yeah, Bismarck, I was just asking um, on behalf of a number of people here who have sent questions in, um, asking about the importance of the cooperative. So, so how important is the community structure, the cooperative in Quapacoco, to you as a farmer? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of these uh, buying agencies, cocoa buying agencies in, in the uh, country. And if you are an individual producer who doesn't belong to any cooperative, it, it means it's going to be difficult for you to channel your grievances, your problems to people to know. But if you come in a corporate form, like you organize yourself, like my cooperative, Kappa Cocoa Farmers Union, it becomes a uniform thing we have is very strong. And whenever there is any problem, farmers, individual farmers have challenges because we are organized. It is very easy for us to present our issues on board. And uh, as a cooperative, almost everything they do for the members is uh, in order. There's no uh, cheat or there's always fairness in presentation. If there's any form of benefit, they make sure every member of the cooperative uh, gets something from it. Because if we are splitted and one person receives the benefit, it means the others may not. But if you are in a corporate uh, uh, cooperative, whatever, whether being a bonus, uh, a premium, uh, any form of motivational thing, because it is a uniform body, we decide on our own what to use those things for. So being in a cooperative is one of the most important things to do as an individual producer like myself. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for uh, Hugo, um, which is actually from um, uh, a, a, a group in a, a primary school in the UK, in Wormley. It's a, it's a question from uh, somebody in year five. Um, and they want to know whether young people in Peru understand what fair trade is. Uh, do young farmers talk about it? Do, is it talked about in schools at all? Sí, um, Hugo, ¿me escuchas? Sí. Ahora tenemos una, una pregunta de, de una niña, de hecho, en el, en el cole, eh, que quería hablar algo de... A ver si los... Ella pregunta si, si ustedes ahí, sobre todo los jóvenes, entienden lo que significa el comercio justo y, y lo valoran. ¿Me puede repetir la pregunta? Sí, la... Sí, no, eh, la idea es, es, era de una, una niña en, en, del colegio aquí de, en Inglaterra y quería saber lo importante del comercio justo para sobre todo los jóvenes, si ¿Sí entienden lo que significa en realidad el comercio justo. ¿Me escuchaste, Hugo? ¿Me escuchas ahora? La pregunta. Ok, ¿me, me escuchas ahora, Hugo? Why don't, why don't we get to ask Bismarck the same question, actually? As Hugo, we're having a problem with your line. Bismarck, just a question about whether the children in the community around Quapacoco, the 100,000 farmers involved in Quapacoco, would their children understand about fair trade? Is it, is it recognized in schools, do you think? Okay, I'll use myself as an example. Before I joined the cooperative initially, whenever you mentioned fair trade, I took it to be the separated fair and then the trade. So until I became part of the cooperative, they had trainings, they made it understand that this, this corporate body who helps producers like myself to have fairness in our trade, give trainings to us as to how best we can go uh, with our farming system. So it's not like something they, they teach in schools, but when you are in the cooperative or you are a member of the cooperative, you have the opportunities to listen to such trainings about fair trade, like uh, the question comes. It's not a general thing that most people are aware of. Yeah, for me, that is how I, I see it. There's lots more to do. There's the, I think the, uh, the beginnings of um, a real network between farming communities and consuming communities around the world, which I think we could be a real strong part of in fair trade. Hugo, good to have you back with us. Um, can I ask, I want to put one more question to you both, and then there's some other questions coming in on the chat. Um, and this is about how you add value to your products. So one of the challenges the world over is for farmers to capture more value in terms of processing or manufacturing. Um, and I, I'm wondering what initiatives you're involved in or what would you like to be involved in to help you do that? Hugo, maybe you first, and then Bismarck. Hugo, ¿me escuchas? Entonces, la primera pregunta es, ¿cómo añades eh, valor eh, en cuanto a la producción eh, de, de lo que produces eh, y sobre todo el, el proceso de eso? ¿Cómo puedes añadir valor? Eh, bueno, este, en mi caso... Como lo comenté anteriormente, y me van a disculpar porque me interesa que falla un poco, mil disculpas. Eh, en mi caso, nosotros producimos este, orgánicamente, ¿no? Y creo que el, el, el valor que le damos en este, en este caso al, al café es eso, ¿no? La calidad y que es un producto totalmente sano, ¿no? Y por el otro lado, eh, estamos haciendo tanto en el caso de café, buscando nuevas formas de generar más ingreso para el productor, ¿no? Por ejemplo, estamos tratando eh, de usar la cáscara, la cáscara del café, que es un subproducto del café, para producir harinas, para producir conservas, eh, ¿no? Y otras cosas más. También eh, usamos eh, el musílago, que también es un producto del café, 
para tratar de, de hacer vinos, también tratar de hacer conservas, mermeladas. Eh, entonces, yo creo que por ahí va ¿no? la, la, la idea de tratar de usar eh, todo lo que se tiene en la finca y todo lo que, lo que se obtiene en este caso del proceso de café, ¿no? Y darle valor agregado y eso eh, eh, utilidad para el productor, ¿no? Creo que para hacer esto se necesita tiempo, se necesita investigación y se necesita recursos, ¿no? Y, y, y para eso también creo que a la mano deben estar todas las instituciones, las cooperativas y también el, el, el Estado, ¿no? Para que un productor eh, pueda salir eh, adelante, ¿no? Muy bien. Um, so, yeah, in my case, I, I have to say my apologies for, for my failing internet connection here, but everything we produce here is, is organic. So the value that gives us is obviously creating, as I've said before, a product that's healthy and it's completely organic. So, so but we're always looking for new ways to, to get more income and, and enable us to, to earn more money from, from what we produce. So that, The way we do this is to try to use absolutely everything that we can get from from our coffee. So whether that's um, skin, whether that's peel, to go on and then make things like flowers or jams, uh, and also taking other sub products of, of coffee to make things like wine and, and and other things. So it's it's something that we can add add value to, and, and we can enable people to to earn more from things. But it takes time, and obviously we need a lot of time to to research. And we need the resources and also um, the time to, to be put in to do this. But it, this is what it's about. It's, it's about being able to, to add value and anything that can kind of give more uh, opportunity to, for our producers to, to earn more money. But we need support also to do this from, from our cooperatives, from our associations, but also the state to enable producers to go on and to produce better. Thank you, Karen. I think we've just lost Hugo, actually. I was going to ask him a follow-up question. So um, everything you said is absolutely right. You need assistance and support at every stage to do that. Um, and I wonder, have you considered roasting your own coffee in Peru and exporting it? Um, estoy muy de acuerdo con lo que dices, pero um, una cosa que quiero preguntar es, ¿has tostado el, tu, tu propio café para exportarlo en, en Perú también? Eh, sí, 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 claro, por supuesto. Yo tengo un pequeño laboratorio, ¿no? ahí voy invirtiendo eh, poco a poco. Digamos que al, al inicio eh, mi idea era de, de poder enseñar a los, a los jóvenes dentro de mi, de mi comunidad ¿no? que, que pueden darle un valor agregado al producto, ya sea el tostado, el tostado molido, ¿no? o también puedes hacer licores a base de café. Entonces lo que yo estoy haciendo ahorita es vender café tostado molido pero dentro de, de Perú nada más, ¿no? Para el tema de, 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 de exportación necesitas más requisitos, necesitas, eh, y, y aparte que el Estado te pone impuestos más al, 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 ya a un producto terminado, ¿no? Pero eh, yo sí estoy actualmente también eh, promocionando ¿no? mi café desde el, desde el campo hasta, hasta el consumidor final, ¿no? So, yeah, so it, it is something that, that I've thought of and it's something I'm actually doing at the moment. I've got my own laboratory where I kind of do bits. Uh, and it, the idea was to kind of to show young people that they can have like added value to, to producing coffee. And it's not just coffee itself. You can go on to, you know, create coffee based liqueurs and things like that. So it is something I'm doing at the moment. I'm selling, you know, ground toasted ground coffee. Um, but I'm only selling that within Peru because once you start to export, there are certain requirements, there are taxes. Um, but yeah, my idea is to promote, you know, um, coffee that's been toasted, that's been ground here, that goes from the field to the cup. Oh, that's fantastic. And that must be an incredible inspiration to uh, the younger generation to see that, you know, farming doesn't need to be, you know, a, 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 as, as, as unremunerative as badly paid as it has been in the past, you know, with, with this kind of ingenuity and innovation, much more is possible. Um, Bismarck, um, would it ever be possible, do you think, that we could have Ghanaian chocolate rather than just Ghanaian cocoa? Could you make yeah. the chocolate yourselves in Kwapa? 
Yeah, I think it's possible with the help of the cooperative coming together, setting up new ideas. I think it is very, very possible. Uh, I remember in the Sankofa project, this uh, partners, Chocolate Harbor, made it uh, a responsibility to come and show us how to make our local milu and then local chocolate uh, for uh, our home consumption. So with that first step, I think if we come as a body, as a cooperative, uh, we can we can do something for ourselves in Ghana. Yeah. Absolutely right. And, and this is something which um, needs substantial government support as well. And he goes right to say that, you know, it's not just the work on the ground, it would also require a change in the tariffs and the taxes that are uh, implemented at the point of import. Um, and recognizing that we do need governments to play their part. We've had a number of questions from people asking if you could sit across the table from world leaders, actually Bismarck, you did that in Glasgow. What would you both say what would you want governments around the world to hear from you? Hugo first and then Bismarck. Hugo, um, si estuvieses en la mismo, misma sala con lo, todos los líderes del mundo, ¿qué cosas les pediría de, de ellos? Um, tienes que quitarles el silencio silencioso. Estás en modo silencio ahora mismo, Hugo, si quieres hablar. Aquí se lo vi, bueno, es que, Hugo, pues si estás todavía en, en modo silencioso, ¿puedes, ¿puedes cambiarlo? ¿Puedes quitarlo? Ok. Ya, yeah, sorry. Eh, para mí, acepto, yo creo que hay una gran crisis en tema de agricultura hoy en día. ¿Por qué? Porque la mayor parte de agricultores están bordeando más de los 60 años, ¿no? Yeah, so for me, there's a big farming crisis that exists at the moment, and I think the reason. Encima de los 60 años de edad, y quieren involucrarse al tema de agricultura porque. Porque no es algunos no les es rentable, entonces. Yo creo que tanto tienes a la agricultura va por el tema unos que hay y el otro es porque falta investigar. Y yo creo que eh, tan, todos los, los gobiernos del mundo deben fijarse en este punto, ¿no? Que debemos producir eh, sanamente y ¿no? porque la agricultura es la fuente de alimentación para todas las personas sin excepción. In all parts of the world. So for, for me, I think we're, we're in the midst of a farming crisis at the moment. And the way you can see that taking place is that the majority of, of farmers, you know, are in and around 70 years of age. You know, it's, it's definitely not something that young people are taking up um, because they don't see farming as a financially sustainable um, livelihood. So I think we need a lot of research. We need governments to look at it, look at specifically this point and understand that farming is is the source of food for the whole world and it's and it's something they really need to take note of absolutely right um and that sense of making farming work for the next generation matters to all of us so much doesn't it it's a very very important point Hugo. um bismarck what would you say if you had the world leaders listening to you now yeah thank you very much i think i still stick to the same message I sent to Glasgow. And, you know, after hearing there have been pledges on supporting producers like myself with 100 billion US dollars, I think uh, for me, anytime I get a platform to pass on any message to the world leaders, I will still maintain that uh, it is time, it is not too late to do, it is time for them to just adhere to their promises, make their promises a reality. Because if uh, these things are being put in place and some of us producers like myself, we have the interest or we, we get the motivational 
uh, factor in uh, producing, I think we are going to solve food security. And we need to think about the future too, because looking at what is happening now, it is getting worse. So it is time we need to do something about it. And that is where they will support us financially so that most of the young ones like myself will come into agriculture, put the table, change the environment, make the whole world a green and a, a conducive area for human and animals to live in. Yeah. Well said, thank you. Um, and that leads me to my last question because unbelievably we're out of time already. We're gonna run over just a couple of extra minutes because we started late. So thank you everybody for bearing with us. Um, but I did want to ask you both to think forward 10 years or so. If we were meeting again, maybe face to face rather than on Zoom in 10 years time, um, what would you want to be able to look back to? What do you want us to have achieved together? over the next 10 years. Bismarck, do you want to go first? And then Ugo? Bismarck? Okay. We are a bit challenged in the network, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, but I, if I heard you right, maybe in 10 years time, what are my expectations? Yeah, okay. Then, uh, currently, uh, for my side, I need to fight hard as an advocate. And I'll be very happy to see Africa all up, across the world, let me not only Africa, but across the world, all producers having a better and a sustainable uh, farming practices. And also to reduce the temperature level most of us are facing and this uh, natural occurrence, over flooding, earthquakes and other things, we know in, in one way or the other, they are being uh, caused by this uh, climate issue. So if you are able to adhere to this new system, go by a better way of agricultural practices and we build our world again, I think when we meet one-on-one, -on -one, we will be laughing instead of uh, the other way around here. Yeah. So, and I'll also be happy here, yeah, I'm part of the advocate who made a broad change to this world in terms of climate crisis. Yeah. Brilliant. Well done. Absolutely right. When we meet again, we'll be laughing. That's that's a fantastic ambition. Hugo, what about you, if you wanted to cast your eyes forward 10 years? Hugo, si pudieras ver ya en 10 años en el futuro, ¿qué, qué te gustaría haber logrado? Y en estos pues, 10 años, Lo que quiero ver es eh, que muchos productores vuelvan dentro de la agricultura orgánica, ¿no? Que se pueda eh, producir sanamente, ¿no? Que ya no de químicos a diestra y siniestra, ¿no? Porque hoy en día la mayor parte de alimentos eh, están o contienen restos de pesticidas, restos de venenos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, lo que yo quisiera es que se produciera eh, para tratar eh, de que los seres contentos y a la vez eh, alimentados de una forma eh, muy sana. Yo eh, soy ambicioso, creo, en, en, este, en esta pregunta, es que quisiera que de repente los gobiernos también involucren o designen más presupuesto a investigar eh, nuevas formas ¿no? de, de, de producir ¿no? eh, sanamente, de producir orgánicamente, de producir ecológicamente. ¿no? Yo creo que aquí adentro de 10 años... Eh, me veo con una serie de, de jóvenes, quizás menores que yo, eh, envueltos más en la agricultura, eh, quizás ya con nuevos productos eh, para ofrecer eh, dentro de, de mi mercado local y quizás dentro de mercados como, como el Reino Unido, ¿no? ¿Por, por qué no productos eh, que pueda ofrecer que sean sanos para 
para, para todos, ¿no? So, what I'd like to see in, in 10 years' time is, is, is farmers going back to producing organically, going back to producing in a more of a, a healthy fashion, um, moving away from, from chemicals. Um, because right now, if you look at the majority of food that we consume or that, that we can see on the market, they all contain pesticides. They all contain um, various elements of poison, of what I see as poison. So my idea was I would like to go back to a way of producing that, that that's extremely healthy and is totally organic. But I think for this to happen, governments need to be involved in this and they need to put aside um, bits of their budget to invest and to invest in research to find out ways that we can produce, as I, as I keep saying, in a healthy way, in a completely organic and ecological way. So if you're asking me what I'd like to see in 10 years is also young people in my area, younger than me, getting into farming, producing new products locally that can be then exported to countries like the UK and we can see on the shelves of, of, of those markets. Oh, that's a fantastic vision. And thank you so much, both of you, for, for inspiring us so much. Um, I'm afraid we have to stop because our time is up. Um, but I did want to say a huge thank you to Bismarck and to Ugo for joining I, from the front line. You know, it's, it's live link up, as you can see by the dodgy internet, but it's a chance for us to hear how farming feels today in Peru and in Ghana. Um, and both of you, I think, have, have captured for us really well the, the sense of the, the expertise, the understanding of farming, the soil, soil health, plant health, that all of us need if we're going to tackle the climate crisis whilst we're also feeding a growing population. Um, we could have talked for much longer. There were many more questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to uh, get to. So thank you everybody for joining and for putting your questions in. There will be more chance to talk about more of this across Fairtrade Fortnite. Kieran, thank you so much for epic translation, particularly with the uh, tough internet link. You did a fantastic job. Um, and I mean, this is the start, right? So this is the start of the next chapter of the conversation about how fair trade farmers around the world are tackling the climate crisis. If you've been interested in what you've heard so far, join in for other events. I think there are 40 of them across across the uh, fair trade fortnight. Um, further details, of course, on our website, fairtrade.org.uk. Um, and see what you can join. And of course, while all of our events are free to attend, if you'd like to support farmers or workers on the front line of the climate crisis, please donate what you can. Um, there should be a QR code on your screen, or if not, there's a link through the Fair Trade Foundation website. Um, and let's keep this conversation going because enough of us want to see this happen. Enough of us want to see the vision that Bismarck and Ugo have started to paint for us today come to life. And if we all work together, we will get there. So keep smiling um, and uh, have a safe and happy fair trade fortnight. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bismarck, Bye. Hugo, thank you so much.